King here. Eddie, how are you, man? Doing great. Toronto's cold, as we did not expect. We expected it to be much warmer, but it's it's very cool. We we are very excited to be on the show. I want to big shout out to the folks at Gibson, Caesar, J J C. I mean, you guys are fantastic. Thank you, and the whole team. Yeah. Age the whole team of Gibson are amazing. Thank you so much for hosting this first Ask Eddie Kramer. Yeah, it's a, Gibson has an awesome team. Awesome team. I've been working with them for years. Beautiful people. So let's get right into it. We've done a number of uh, Q and A's in the past of, at the NAM show, and you and I have known each other for a long time. Um, what I would really like to uh, do in this gathering is give people the experience that I've had with you of like really humanizing Jimmy and and uh, all your adventures with him. So I'd like to start with a few questions, if that's okay with you. Please. First one is, how much pre-production was done before Jimmy would enter the studio? That's something I always wondered about. That's a great question because thinking about how he was in the studio coming in for the first time when I first saw pre-production that they had done, from what I gathered, just lost me for a brief second, but that's okay. I'm back on again. Was the fact that he lived with Chas his who encouraged Jimmy to write songs. And in the beginning, when Jimmy first started, uh, in fact, his first show at the Paris Olympia in 1966, all cover songs. And it was only when he got back to England that Chas was the one who said, you gotta write, you gotta write. So as you, as we all know, the first song that came out was Hey Joe, which was a cover song. And he was in the midst of this writing frenzy with Chaz for the first record. Um, and the way they would write is the, the inspiration was science fiction because Chaz left science fiction. He had books and comic books and stuff and Jimmy totally got into that. Mm -hmm. And that you can hear a lot of that in the lyrics. So, the pre-production was done in the apartment before he even got to the studio. So by the time they get in there, they've rehearsed, they've done the thing, and you you wouldn't believe how fast it was. It was like within two or three takes sometimes, bang, it was done. Thank you very much. So th th did they rehearse parts um, intensely or, or just uh, an energy that they would like those parts to get? over multiple takes once a song was written in the apartment they would go to a rehearsal space they would rehearse i wasn't there for any of the rehearsals of course because mm -hmm. i'm in the studio you know working as, a, as an engineer but from what i heard from the guys this was the way they worked rehearse go to the studio you have three hours and it, usually in the three hours they cut two songs so they had their shit together yeah yeah Wow. Okay. Well, that's, that's, that's good to hear. That's, that's inspiring. Um, another one. Um, did you and Jimmy have the same viewpoint of the studio? Meaning, was it an instrument? Did he or you view it as an instrument? Or was it just a place to get the ideas recorded? Well, how, how, how did you guys view that? By the time Jimmy came to Olympic Studios, which was late, uh, um, excuse me, big part, early January. Mm -hmm. uh, they'd already been in the studio with Chaz. They recorded three or four songs. But Olympic was this brand new, independent, cool, cool studio. Very cutting edge, great console, beautiful sound in the room. So when Jimmy walked in, he was impressed. You know, it was a big space. He could turn the amp up. You know, we had the drums with a little screen on the top to keep the the sound in and separating the bass and all the rest of that so when he walked in for the first time he was absolutely bowled over he was so impressed and then put mics up he's listening i said jimmy come into the control and have a quick listen and for the first time he had never heard the sound of that room he came in and listened he said mm -hmm, okay <laughs> so he runs out into the studio and starts tweaking. We both got lost for a second. We are dropping out, folks, but we'll keep going. Um, 
So he hears that sound for the first time. He says, hmm, okay. And he runs out in the studio and starts tweaking his amp. And I'm twiddling knobs and getting reverbs and EQ and all that. And it was a question of upping the ante. Who's on top? Okay, well, you've done that. Well, I'll try this. So it was an exciting experience for Jimmy. And he adored the studio. So the studio was a playground. This was the place for inspiration. Mm-hmm. That, and so it leads, to, it leads really nicely into the next question. Um, I've had a, the opportunity to work with you, and I, I've I've seen you make decisions about sound. When uh, you and Jimmy were working together, um, how did you resolve any difference in uh, maybe a technical approach to something? If he wanted something a certain way, and you, or you may have thought that something was better, how did you guys manage that? When you listen to the records, it all just sounds like magic. But how did you guys negotiate things like that? Well, I think what was happening was that we inspired, I mean, certainly imagine for the very first time you walk in the studio and you hear Jimmy Sam, it's like, oh my God. <laughs> I mean, how the hell, the hell am I going to record that? That was my first reaction. Yeah. But then after the shock of that, <laughs> you know, like, okay. And, and like I said, he's now got the confidence that the sound that I'm going to be getting for him is cool. Mm -hmm. um, we may be off the ad, I don't know, but I'll keep talking. Uh, but there we are. We're back on again. Um, it was the comfort zone. He loved the sound that we were creating. So therefore, as he progressed with his knowledge of what the studio could do for him mm -hmm. specifically, he would he he was even more relaxed. He would just go in there knowing that whatever he did, I would try to capture it as best I could and maybe make an improvement to the sound that he was producing. So therefore it was adding to the layers of trust, adding to the layers of sound complexity, and then trying some wacky thing. I, I to me I love to experiment. And whether it was tape delay, slowing the speed of the delays down, making repeat echoes, trying different EQs and compression, it would all result in the layers of the sound uh, improving what he had conceived of. That, you, know, you hit, you hit um, a key word there, trust. You know, um, at, a, at a certain point, you, you got to trust someone to try something and believe in what their abilities are. So I really like that. I'm glad you, you pointed that out. Um, how receptive was Jimmy to musical suggestions by the band and other guest musicians as time went on? Well, that is a touchstone point, isn't it? Huh? Okay, well, basically, you never told Jimmy Hendrix what to play or anything like that, except, well, I w there are some exceptions. Chaz Chandler was a stickler for the structure of the song. And in other words, he, because Chaz came from this background of, you know, top 40 songs, he was with the animals, you know, um, but he had a very good, I mean, being the bass player with the animals and he had a wonderful sense of where Jimmy was at. Mm -hmm. And even though the restrictions were, okay, we only have maybe an eight bar solo or it's a 12 bar solo. That's all you've got. You can't, stretch it out to 16 bars, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there were those restrictions uh, and those were the suggestions and Jimmy took those well. Um, in terms of the band, I would say Mitch, because of his ability to interpret what Jimmy's moves were going to be and where the, where the song was going, you know, technically he was very adept. I mean, he had, came from that Elvin Jones jazz yeah kind mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. And he was so on top of what Jimmy was doing. And you could almost see him interpret stuff. Mm. Making a suggestion? Not so sure. Jimmy was the one who came up with the bass lines for the most part. Although Noel was a very good bass player and did come up with some lines, but it was Jimmy's suggestion as to what those lines should be. Um, later on, when we got to America in, in, in 68, and we started working on Electric Ladyland, that was when the doors sort of kicked open and 
Jimmy was on his own. He could make his own decision as to what he wanted rather than have somebody dictate to him what should be. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, so here's, a, here's something I've always wondered. I've been meaning to ask you this over the years. Being someone that Jimmy trusted, as you said, were you ever in a position to influence his musical um, decisions? Um, w w did that ever come up? Well, it, it's it's a great question because I I, I was thinking about how he, my relationship with him had, had developed during that that initial period in that first you know three three two or three months. Um, I would I would say the only thing that I feel that I could possibly have contributed was by accident because I was in the studio and my background is classical music initially and then into jazz and then into pop and rock and roll. So I was in the studio just messing in between takes and I was messing around on the piano and I hit this uh, augmented ninth chord with gong gang, gong gang, and Jimmy wanders over to me and says, "Hey man." What's that chord you're playing? Show me that chord. And I'm like, oh, okay. it's like a C minor augmented chord, whatever, you know. And he said, damn, that's cool. Play it on this track. And it was cross. There were two songs that was actually on the song, Cross Down Traffic and uh, what was the other one? Can't remember. <laughs> but anyway, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you in a second. So he said, no, you play it. You play it. Um, no, no, I, I don't want to play it, Jimmy. I'll show you the chords. So I showed him the chords. You play it. And I set up the mics, and he actually played it using my chords. So that was the only time I ever influenced him with any kind of thing. But he, he loved the fact that I had come up with that chord sequence. That's awesome. That's great. That's a great story. Um, did, did he lean towards multiple takes for perfection, or was he prone to just going with it because the magic was there uh, at a given at any given moment about anything. Well, Jimmy was a perfectionist. You're absolutely right. Uh, no question about it. Uh, as I said in the beginning, you know, the, the takes would be magical. Sometimes first, second, or third take, bang, done. Other times there was some problems, not insurmountable problems, but problems of, you know. I don't really like the feel of that one. I'm looking for, and you knew he was going for something. Got to do another one, got to do another one. And we would end up with, two, well, classic example is um, all along the Watchtower where we ended up with like 20, 26 or 27 takes, something like that. Uh -huh. But they was looking for something very specific. The rhythm section wasn't quite gelling. Dave Mason's guitar wasn't quite gelling in the beginning. Mitch made mistakes, da da da. And Jimmy was yelling at Mitch and all that, and that would happen um, increasingly as the career went on. Particularly when we got to America and, and started working on Electric Lady, now we would jam. He would jam for hours, but in terms of finding that particular take, if it wasn't there in the first few, there's a search going on. And but you could sense. Here's the cool thing. You could sense the, the journey. You, as the takes progressed, you could kind of get the feeling. He's, I know he's, he's after something, and all of a sudden it would just come together the, like the last before the actual master. You just said, Jimmy, that was great. Yeah, 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 one more, one more, one more. <laughs> and there it was within like two, bang, and it was like he had climbed this mountain to get to that point. It was just so cool. And the expression on his face was, yeah, man, let me hear that. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, okay, so one of those moments, like, yeah, man, let me hear that. Uh, can you think of any, any particular moment where an inspiration may have changed the course of a tune, you know, while you were working on it? Just mm. have him rethink the tune or rethink an album, you know, anything like that? I'm not sure it's a rethink, but it was a, I, I can remember this one time we were doing Axis, and we'd come to the title track, mm -hmm. Axis Falls Left, and we'd come to the track. And at this particular point in Olympic history and my history, we were fooling around with something called phasing. Now, 
it so happened that prior to this, we had had we had been honored to have the Beals. I recorded the Beals twice at Olympic, and we had asked Sir George Martin. I say, George, how do you how did you get that phasing sound on on uh, Strawberry Fields? And he said. Well, chaps, I tell you, if you look in the uh, BBC Radiophonics Handbook from 1949, <laughs> you'll actually find it there. <laughs> was there Jesus. Uh, thanks a lot, George. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we pursued this quest for, since the Beatles had done it in mono, we said, okay, we're going to top that. And we got it. We figured out a way how to do it in stereo. And at this particular point, I, we had we had tried this little section, you know, the drum break in the middle of boom, boom, boom. That's when the phasing kicks in. Yeah. Jimmy had no idea what was going to happen, so I said, "Hey, come in and check check this out. We want to play you something." So we had set it up, and Jimmy's sitting behind me on the couch. And when the phasing kicks in. Jimmy lost his mind. He mm. fell off the couch and was grabbing his head and he says, oh my God, I can't believe you. How did you do that? Play it again, play it again. So we played it again. Oh, he, he, <laughs> went, he went absolutely crazy. He said, hey man, I want that shit on everything. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Uh, so let's ask, uh, so we're, break, we're um, doing this um, presentation in two sections. Uh, this first section is focusing on the studio, and then the next section will focus on uh, your live experiences with Jimmy. But I'll ask one more question, uh, one more studio question, and then we'll open it up to Q&A for about 10 minutes or so. Uh, last studio question. Uh, did Jimmy always write what he felt, or did he did he edit himself? Because, you know, he, he was a man at a time, at a very interesting time in our history, where there was a lot going on. And so... Did he freely write what he was thinking about or what? Good question. I'm trying to, yeah, I wish I could get it. To, uh, if you can be in the man's mind, I can, I can only react from the experience of being in the room. No, quote unquote, no, no pun intended. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's a tough one because I think if one looks at I experienced an axis, I think he was much more in the heavy rock and roll pop thing. You know, the songs had to be a little shorter. Yes, there were jams, and yes, there were pieces where it was stretched out and experimental stuff. Yes, no question. Um, but I feel that the, the 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 expression from Jimmy's soul was always in there, no matter what direction the, so the song was going in. Whatever, he would have fun with it, he would enjoy it. It's still Jimmy, he's still playing a blues part, he's still doing the stuff that his musical roots had taught him. But where I think it really started to change was Electric Ladyland. That's when a lot more blues, that's when the thing really, stretch out. I mean, think of some of those pieces of music. We're 14, 15 minutes long. That's a touch of where Jimmy was at. And then the next level after Woodstock in 69, Jimmy says, well, we're nothing but a band of gypsies and bang, by the end of the year, yes. Did he have to satisfy that contract? Yes, he did. But he put a fabulous band together. And that's where it goes to the, the other level. The higher level of R&B, blues, funk, all of that. And, and that, what an incredible band with, with Buddy and Billy. I mean, phenomenal. Mm -hmm. So all these different levels of points in his life, you, I don't know if you can really separate. You can just say, okay, this is the journey he's on and this is the musical direction he's going in. Okay, cool. I'm uh, um, just uh, getting our chat thing happening here. Um, great. Um, and, and you, you and I have talked a lot over the years, and a lot of what you just shared is news to me because I never really presented those questions in this way. Yeah. So I'm really glad to experience. I'm seeing some of the questions up on the screen here. They, these look like really interesting ones. What do you see? 
I saw one that said, did Jimmy really describe music in color? Absolutely. Uh, like, oh, cool. Yeah. Can I dive into that one? Yeah, please. All right. So we had a code that it was it was so funny. I was just thinking about this the other day. Um, he had a color code for various types of sounds. Uh, red was maximum distortion. Purple was like the next level down. Um, green was reverb. Um, I can't remember what some of the other ones were, but the red, the green, the blues. Uh, black sometimes entered into it, and brown did, obviously, because there's a darker sort of colors for just lower kinds of distortion. Maybe it was a bass sound or something mm -hmm. like that. But it, when we were in the Electric Lady Studios, which we had just built for him, the lights in the studio uh, were fantastic. It was like a theatrical lighting system. Mm -hmm. And we, we could wash the, the white carpet walls, and we could wash each wall in different colors and combine them too. We had this huge lighting knobs on this big piece of stainless steel. These are theatrical lighting dials. And he would say to me, hey man, give me a little more purple. So I just I just mm -hmm. want to hear what's going on. Yeah, it puts me more in the mood. Give me some mm -hmm. more. And a little bit of green on that wall, you know. So <laughs> I would know what he was saying. Okay, that's the vibe you want. Oh, yeah. I, I, could, I could dig that, yeah. Uh, there's a question uh, from Voodoo Apex, who wants to know, how many tracks Jimmy recorded per song? Oh, you a, mean guitar tracks? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I thought it was an album question. Okay, yeah. yeah. Mm. It depends. I mean, in the beginning, we only had four tracks to work with. Four tracks. <laughs> so we had to be really careful. So the basic track would be drums and stereo, bass, and one track, one rhythm track for Jimmy's guitar. But if you listen to that guitar track, it's lead and rhythm at the same time, kind of. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's the way he's playing. It sound, It could be almost the lead part. Then we would bounce to another four machine, four track machine, and then record another track of Jimmy, plus the solo on the lead vocal track in between the lead vocal. <laughs> mm. So that was where we were limited. Yeah. Um, but obviously, as we progressed, you know, became eight track and 12 track and then 16. 16 was the most. And then by the time we hit 16 track, Jimmy would be putting five or six guitar tracks on. And mm -hmm. I'd then be, have to mix it down and say, thanks, Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. These questions are coming in fast and furious here. Yes, they are. Uh, you can see the same ones I see, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Okay. Anything? Uh, oh, here's a here's a question from Peru. Oh, uh, yeah. did, did you use any reverb on Jimmy's on Jimmy's amps? Uh, same question for drums and bass. Well, the, the the reverb was always added later. We had a wonderful thing called an EMT plate, which was this enormous piece of steel suspended in a piece of metal tubing, and it had an amplifier, drove it. But the sound of an EMT plate was pretty much the sound that you hear on all of his tracks. Is this either it's a seven and a half IPS pre delayed with a tape machine? So it, the signal for the echo is pre delayed by a tape machine by the width of the, the head gap, either at 15 IPS, which is inches per second, or seven and a half inches per second. And that gave that lovely lilting feel to the reverb but it was always added afterwards it was his amps were always dry cool uh here's a question from uh cam milia i guess that's pronounced was there a song or project that jimmy was most proud of that's that's a that's something i've always wondered myself wow i jeez that's a tough one um I think he was very uh, happy with what the first album was, even though it was a primitive album. I mean, look, look what it yielded. It, mm -hmm. it, his career took off from there. Um, Axis was an experimental album. I don't know if he was ever, okay, let's address this issue of, of, of an artist who is obviously the, the world's greatest guitar player. There's no question about it, a genius on every level. 
but we all know by reading about geniuses, whether it's Van Gogh or whoever, they're never satisfied. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess any artist worth his or her salt is never really satisfied. And I don't think Jimmy was ever satisfied. I think he was very happy recording Electric Ladyland, definitely, because he was now, it was now, this was his world that he had built. Mm -hmm. you know? And he was very happy recording at Electric Lady Studios, which was something that his hard work had purchased, so to speak. But in terms of an album, I mean, Band of Gypsies, even though there were some issues uh, in terms of how it had to happen and his, uh, I wouldn't say dissatisfaction, but I think he, he knew that this was going to be a fabulous record in spite of all the difficulties. Mm -hmm. He was a, Sometimes he was a difficult person to read, mm -hmm. but I know that the dissatisfaction comes from being such a perfectionist. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, here, here's one, um, more of a commercial question. Uh, will uh, Royal Albert Hall be released? No freaking clue, mate. It's, it's, from, it's from Angela <laughs> Angela Campbell. That's another thing that I wonder. It's it's a I've I've mixed it already, and it sounds amazing. It's it's but I've no bloody clue, mate. I, if if I had the answer to that, you'd be the first to know. <laughs> okay. Somebody, uh, a, somebody uh, says here, one of the questions, if I may jump in, Drew yeah, yeah. Puzzi, I want to know if Jimmy was on training sessions. No, initially, but yes, afterwards. So in the beginning, well, actually, uh, uh, let me let me readdress that. In the very beginning, yes, he was on time because Chaz was bringing him to the session. <laughs> he had to be there at 7 o'clock. Uh, Jimmy was notoriously late, for mostly. But by the time... Uh, you know, 1968 rolls around and we're doing Electric Ladyland. Uh, he doesn't arrive till midnight. He's over, why? He's over at the scene. Mm -hmm. The scene club was, okay, New York City, 8th Avenue, goes uptown. And then there's 44th Street. That's where the studio was on 46th there was this place called The Scene. And Jimmy mm -hmm. used to hang there from maybe 10 o'clock at night all the way up to about midnight or so. Why? Because he was looking for the, the best bunch of musicians who could hang with him and play. Mm -hmm. And quite often he, well, this is how, you know, Voodoo was recorded because the British invasion, you know, Steve Winwood was in town. He was jamming with him. I mean, Jack Cassidy was there at the scene that night. Jimmy comes over to the record plant at midnight. We've been there since seven. Set up all the mics. He walks in dragging like 15, 20 people behind him. And one rehearsal, one take, bam, there's Voodoo Child. It's, wow. it's just, that's, that's how it went. Now, Cut to Electric Lady Studios, which we record. Uh, we were in the studio four months before he left for England, unfortunately, and passed away. Every time he was in the studio, he was on time. Seven o'clock every night, he was there. It was fantastic because he loved that studio. That was his home. That was his yeah. baby. Yeah, that's a that's a beautiful place. A uh, couple of times, the first time I ever went there, you were there doing uh, some presentation. Beautiful vibe. Um, one last question for this segment before yep. we move to the live thing. And knowing that you're going to be doing a couple of these and uh, you'll be doing what about Zeppelin, which uh, I look forward to. Yep. This, this yep. question, yep. Yeah, yep. some band, they're still, yep. trying to, they're still trying to make it, but I think they have a, I think <laughs> they have a shot. Um, this is a question from uh, Keegan Mulholland. And the question is, how much of an influence did Jimi Hendrix in the studio have on Jimmy Page and Led Zeppelin in their albums? I don't know. I mean, is Jimmy Page aware of Jimi Hendrix? Of course. Did he ever talk about it? No. <laughs> I didn't. I can't see that. I don't see the connection there somehow. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure Jimmy Page appreciated what Jimi Hendrix had done, but he, I don't think I ever heard him talk about it. Mm -hmm. 
Um, cool. I tell you what I can say, in my mind, when I, I think about Jimmy Page and Jimi Hendrix, the two Jimmies, they both had this very um, strict path. They come in the studio with a preconceived notion pretty much of what that song is going to be and what it's going to do and where it's going to go. They were both very much in control of the session. And Paige is a brilliant producer as well as obviously a fantastic guitar player. But they had a concept in their head. And, you know, nothing would moved off that path. You're going straight down there until you get that song in the can and it sounds great. Yeah, I can appreciate that. Definitely. Okay, so let's let's now switch over to the um, live Section segment. Two. Yeah. Let's switch over to the live segment. I have a couple of uh, questions for you. Sorry to have to keep looking down here. Um, You're forgiven. <laughs> that's a good movie, actually, The Unforgiven. Ooh. Uh, what was Jimmy's approach to rehearsals before shows? The only thing I can remember would be the rehearsals that he did at Baggy Studios, because I was never really privy to a lot of rehearsals except those, which was the rehearsals for the Band of Gypsy shows. Um, you know, Billy and Buddy, good friends, they hung out. They had to put this band together, and, and the sessions were so much fun. I remember popping down there a couple of times to say hi and stuff and listening and play. Boy, was that powerful. Jeez, Louise. That was just phenomenal. And if you hear the tapes, the Baggy Studios rehearsal tapes, they're right on. I mean, they're just like the show. It's mm. just ridiculous. And they did rehearse for a, a, a good month, I believe. Okay. Somebody could correct me on the on the actual data, but that was the only time I was privy to the rehearsal. I mean, mm -hmm. I can tell you one other thing though. That's really interesting because the live shows that were recorded, I I didn't record live shows except for for Woodstock. Uh, a guy named Abe Jacobs, who was on the road with Jimmy a lot, he recorded a lot of the stuff, and he's a very good engineer. Um, some of the stuff like at Berkeley, you've heard the Jimmy at Berkeley live. Mm -hmm. Fantastic live album, fantastic performance. The rehearsals were taped, and some of the stuff that's on that record is the actual rehearsal. It's incredible. I mean, the band is just so tight. It's you just pick up the guitar, and say, "Okay, we're going to do this." Bang, and they're in. Mm. Well, speaking of Woodstock, uh, uh, that that's not that wasn't one of my questions, but I, I'd like to go to that. Um, with all the leg well all the stuff that happened during that whole weekend how what were, what were what were the challenges of actually recording that show um you've shared some of those things with, with various artists but were there any particular challenges recording Jimmy's set uh, during Woodstock yes it was bloody early in the morning mm -hmm. <laughs> i'd been up all night and so had Jimmy probably he was supposed to go on i think at two in the morning and it was nine in the morning mm -hmm. and you should have seen what the, that hill looked like. It was full of mud. It was from a half a million people it was down to probably a hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, when you think about that show and how Jimmy was, he pumped himself up. He pumped the band up. He got the crowd at it. And then it has, some of the most stunning music that you can't deny the Star Spangled Banner. Jeez, Louise, that, that, that's like one of the crowning glories. And the whole set, I mean, there were some, a couple of raggedy moments here and there, but for, for the most part, a, a lesson in guitar playing, some of the breakdowns where he's just by himself soloing. Oh, what? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you watch his hands and it's like, is he really doing that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it is a bit of a geeky question. Um, how involved was Jimmy, if he was involved at all, in dialing in, in a live situation, in dialing in the rest of the band members' sounds? Was he involved in that with you? No, no. Mm -hmm. I mean, the only thing that he could do, he would turn to, to Noel, if it was Noel playing bass, or if it was Billy, give me an E, give me an E. 
because obviously there were no tuners in those days and Jimmy would rely on the bass to be staying in tune and he would use that to tune up with. He would be very patient. I mean, if you listen to those live tapes, the amount of tweaking and banging around that Mitch would be doing, you know, I, I remember listening to some of these tapes there's a roadie in front, <laughs> I, I, and I could hear it. There's a piece of wood. He's obviously hammering in some nails in front of the face. Of the <laughs> oh, good grief. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, so you talk about the live performances, and we're, we're all mesmerized by those performances. Um, how critical was he of his – I'm assuming he was critical, but did any of these these great performances that – we know as legendary, was he moved by any of those the way we have been over time? I think he was moved when the crowd was yeah. into it and he got a reaction from it. Because obviously on stage there, the PA is pretty crappy. You know, you're trying to figure the lights, of, you, know, you can't really see it. But when you could, in some of the smaller theaters, like the Berkeley one I mentioned, uh, and maybe some of the larger ones where – he got the feeling that the crowd was with him. He would he would say, "Thank you, man. Thank you, man. Thank you." You know, but he would mumble that stuff because he he was pretty shy as a, as an individual. Yeah, I yeah. think everything was in him. It's focused from the brain through the heart into the fingers and out to the audience and and let it go out. I mean, he's um, we've seen the performances. We we know what he can do to a crowd. It's just. It's earth shattering. How mm. how do you give all of that all the time? I mean, it must drain you. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 Um, what uh, what is your favorite um, live musical uh, performance of Jimmy's? And what's your favorite live technical recording that you were able to capture, or oh, that was has been captured? Hmm. Two part question. I, I think I think I've already mentioned uh, the two that I really like, which is Berkeley, um, and certainly Woodstock parts of it. Definitely fantastic. Uh, Monterey, jeez, mm -hmm. he just stuns the audience and and, and basically launches his career. I, I can't say this one specific. I mean, to me, they're like building blocks for his career. Okay, use Monterey as a great example. He's pretty much unknown in America. He comes to the U.S. to do the Monterey Pop Festival. Who is the guy who gets him on the show? It's Paul McCartney. Mm -hmm. McCartney is the guy who calls up the, uh, the promoters of the show. Hey, you got to put Jimi Hendrix on this show. And he gets out there, tops everything by burning the guitar. It's, it's a significant moment in in musical history, particularly in Jimmy's, it, it, it launches his career. There it is, right mm -hmm. then and there. And it's a great performance. I mean, that showmanship, woo! Yeah. <laughs> With the feather boa and the, oh, come on. How, I, nobody had ever seen anything like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, let's, you know, let, let's jump to the Q&A. Let's get, jump to the questions earlier in this segment, because uh, yeah. I, I would like to get more of uh, the audience's, uh, questions in because uh, I could always ask you my questions in private. Um, wow, well, some long ones here. Do you see anything here that you'd like to jump on? Uh, if there's something about anything to do with Jimmy or just a live thing or what? Anything, anything. Uh, let's see. Oh, here's one from a R Ricky a Ricosa. One of the greatest challenges of recording Jimmy live, especially with regard to his reproducing studio tones, effects, and production. Very good question. Hey, hey, that was my that was one of my questions. There must be a camera in there. Yeah. Oh, was, was, okay, hey, great. Great. Ricosa, did you know that man's a genius. Stuff? That's very clever. All right. <laughs> so um impossible for Jimmy and the band to reproduce what they had in the studio. There's no way. It's it's just was not going to happen, which is why he didn't play certain songs. Um, particularly if there's piano parts, if there's extra percussion, all that, you can't duplicate. It's just three guys. So his performance is based upon the power of the trio, how the tones of the 
bass and the guitar and how the drums integrate with everything. That's how that's going to project out. And you know how crappy the PAs were in those days. I mean, you know, some some of those voice of the theater speakers and a, and a bunch of mics and good luck. Mm -hmm. um, Jimmy had a challenge not only with uh, with the with his amps blowing up. Uh, the marshals, you know, eventually they got it sorted. That's why they would always have plenty of spares. Um, reproducing the tones, it's it's tough. But when you hear the live stuff, it's got its own vibe. It is not the studio stuff. It is the live performance. And I dearly love the live stuff because it just shows this ability for this huge talent to sort of really stretch. And I don't mean that physically, although he was jumping around and <laughs> by playing it with his teeth and all of that, which you would never do in the studio. It'd be no point, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think his main problem, Jimmy's main challenge was the sound. How the hell is he going to hear himself? The, the monitors were probably crappy. It, it was, it was, a ch this was his big beef. Yeah. Was, they got better towards the end, you know, in, in 1970, you know, the, 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 some of the tours, they were getting not too bad. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, nice question. <laughs> um, here's a question um, that uh, from uh, Jason Callis, Jason R. Callis. Uh, but I'll read the question and then I would like to rephrase the question, if I may, Jason. Um, the question is, do you think uh, the band got stronger with Billy Cox. Before you answer that question, I would like to ask it this way: What were what were the what were the differences in those in the versions of the band, uh, say Band of Gypsies versus uh, the Experience? You know. Well, there's there's there are two parts to this answer, and I think you I go with this because. Once the band of gypsies was formed and played thing, and Jimmy abandoned it pretty quickly thereafter, he had to put back the experience. And I think there was a financial reason, and there was probably some personal reasons. Him and uh, Buddy didn't quite see eye to eye. You know, Buddy wanted to be uh, up front and singing and yeah, yeah, doing all that. And he put the new back together, which was uh, Mitch and Billy and Jimmy. And I think that was a killer band because Billy Cox, to my mind, was phenomenal. I mean, just his funk, his intuition in terms of being with Jimmy and knowing him so well. And the fact that the two of them would, this was an incident that in the studio and in rehearsals, Billy Cox would suggest a bass line. And Jimmy would say, yeah, that's cool. Mm -hmm. And that's the time when he would take something from a fellow musician, somebody he would deeply trusted. And the effect to me was, I, I think that that band that he lived would have gone on and really done something. Cool. Um, Jimmy's jams, let's see, include. Uh, here's a question from uh, Ronnie Ruiz. Do any of Jimmy's jams at the scene club exist? Were any of those recorded? Oh, I, you know, I wish. <laughs> There's so many places that he jammed. There were some gems. People may have had cassette machines, but hey, is there anybody else? You know, if Jimmy had the scene club, I would love to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's a question. Um, what else we got? Let's see. This anything catch anything catch catch your ear catch your eye? Um, somebody's caught my ear and it's pulling on. Uh, wait. <laughs> um, uh, I don't see any more questions. Uh, maybe I should uh, scroll up here and see. Oh, here we go. Hey, Eddie, can you hear me? <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't see any more questions. Mine has stopped giving me comments here. It's just telling me I'm see. a twit. Uh, um, <laughs> Uh, let's see. Uh, well, well uh, any of the, any thoughts on on any of what we've touched that I may have cut short 
Well, I look for some more questions here. Well, no, let, let me let me ask you something. Um, um, when when you and Jimmy met, uh, I know you met him under interesting circumstances uh, over in, over in England. Um, how long did it take the two of you to really suss out that just as people you can work together? Was it just a musical marriage, or was it? Was it a personal, a spiritual connection, or something like that too? That's that's an interesting question. I think that Jimmy was pretty much on his own. He had a very, very close circle of friends. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be in the studio with him and work with him closely, but on a social level, it was very minimal. In, in when we when I got to America, there were a couple of times where we we did hang out a bit, and there's a couple of stories about that, but. For the most part, he was a man unto himself. Um, mm. And certainly in, in the first um, three or four months when I was working with him, he, he it was a professional relationship and a good one and an open one. And, and he dug what I did and I dug what he did. But it would not to a normal thing. And those, uh, he was with Chaz, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I will say, though, that Later on, as you know, we were working together uh, in '69. Um, it was a, a wonderful occasion, Jimmy's birthday, if I may tell the story. Please. Um, it's November 27th, 1969, and Jimmy called me up, which was very unusual. Uh, hey, man, what are you doing? You want to go see the Stones tonight? The Stones were playing in Madison Square Garden. And I said, yeah, yeah, fine. I'll, I'll meet you outside the, the back door of Madison Square MSG. So I meet him there, and the guard recognizes us, and we go up in the elevator and go and see the Stones. Everybody knows everybody because mm -hmm. the Stones would hang out with Jimmy. Jimmy would hang out with them. And it was, it was a wonderful time to watch Mick and Jimmy sitting together on a bench backstage just shooting the shit. Um, and but those were rare occasions, you know. It was not like I would hang with Jimmy every night. No, uh, mm -hmm, we, mm -hmm. we had a great working relationship with those exceptions. Okay, I uh, know I'm seeing some. Some uh, just to let everyone know, I, I see some really good questions. Uh, the, the questions that are a bit technical, I try not to uh, get too far down a rabbit hole. We want to keep this kind of general so everyone can can um, appreciate a particular answer that might come. Um, here's one. This is uh, it's from uh, Jeremiah Jones. Mm. Uh, it says, um, it sounds like a movie, actually, Jeremiah Jones. Um, what was one of the toughest songs you had to work on with Jimmy? Now, I don't know what he means by toughest, but what, it, what does toughest mean to you? I would say all along the Watchtower was probably one of the toughest I remember. There were others, but this one just stands out of my mind uh, just because of the way it was put together, you know. We were started to record it, and it was like 10, 15 takes in, and no, oh, no, no, this is not happening. The I hadn't heard Jimmy yell at Mitch. That was the first time. Mm -hmm. Hey, man, I don't know, why can't you get this up? If you listen to the intro of All Along the Watchtower, the time – in the first four bars turns around and Jimmy loved that. But to get Mitch to do that, that was a, that was a trick because he it messed him up a bit to mm. say the least. And then of course we got two acoustic guitars. Jimmy's playing a six string, Dave Mason's playing a 12 and who knows what people had been ingesting in those days. <laughs> or what had been smoking? I don't know. Cause I didn't, you know, I didn't participate in that in those days. Ha, but <laughs> you know the intro was chang 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 chang, and then there was some timing issues, and Jimmy was getting all pissed off about that. And finally, we get the take together, and we're rolling along, and it's just it was just like, oh come on, we got to get this, we got to. And like I said, by take twenty seven, we were there, mm -hmm. but that there was a battle, mm -hmm. and Noel left the session because he couldn't take it anymore. He went to the pub and got pissed. Wow. And, and then Jimmy played the bass, which mm -hmm. was that fabulous bass part. Yeah. yeah. Upside down. 
Mm. <laughs> um, uh, just a share a, qu a quick story, and maybe you can, if you can remember what it might have been like. Um, wh when I heard you working on um, uh, one of the one of the re releases last year, actually, it's the one behind me. Um, you you played um of a uh, voodoo child for me. Um, mm. And oh, the five the five point one surround sound. Yes, and I remember I remember <laughs> listening to, and I won't say here publicly because there may be children listening, so I won't say what I said when I heard it, but I was just astounded um, about how that sounded. Do you remember much about those sessions? Because that I know that's a favorite song of a lot of people. Um, anything particular? Uh, what about that? made just made that track explode you know what was happening what was well yeah. there, there's some action this could address some of the people who are asking technical questions voodoo yeah. child you're referring to right from yeah. the record yeah. right yeah. electric lane okay and i did do the the front part of the story it was jimmy coming down the street by the way imagine with the hat the feather the guitar the bell bottom, the whole outfit. And he's walking down 8th Avenue to the studio, trailing 15, 20 people, stopping traffic, walks into the record plan, through the front door, bam, into the studio. Couple of rehearsals and we do the take. Now, what was happening in the studio was, if you thought that this was the normal guitar amp, it was not. What amp was it? It was a Fender mm -hmm. amp which was mm -hmm. very, it was using a Showman amp and a Showman bottom of the big, the giant one. It was like eight tens or something like that. And that's what you hear because his vocal is live in the studio. Mm -hmm. And you can hear that, oh, which is leaking into all the instruments. And, yeah, yeah. And that thing had such a vibe. I mean, it's got, you, you can feel it breathing. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it had a real... It had a real beautiful, has a real beautiful ferocity. Yeah. You know, if, if anybody gets a chance, uh, listen to the, what we put out, the, the 50th anniversary of Electric Ladyland. And on yeah. the box set, there's a DVD. And on the DVD, there's the 5.1 surround sound mixes, which took me three months to do. And I duplicated literally every single note and every phrase of, delay it's a pretty damn close to the original but in five one and you hear jimmy's guitar going Wee! Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's worth a listen the oh yeah that's 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 an experience if i may be so uh obvious bold. <laughs> yeah, if i may be so bold about my love for this um uh so we're, we're we're approaching zero hour uh we're gonna have to wrap it up shortly but what do you have going on eddie what, what's what's coming up in your artistic and business life? Well, we got a few things coming. Uh, thank you for asking. I've got mm -hmm. a documentary film that was just announced. It's called From the Other Side of the Glass. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, um, you could um, visit uh, my Facebook page. You can also see stuff on there about it. Um, it it's, it's a project that's been in the works for a couple of years. And uh, my friend uh, Spencer Proffer, who is producing it, uh, is, is largely responsible for helping us put it together. Mm -hmm. And John Dorsey is the director. And we have some Emmy Award uh, and Academy Award folks involved. It's, uh, I'm in the middle of working on it. I'm working on the book and the script and everything. And hopefully we'll get to start shooting it uh, maybe, the, maybe next year early. I want yeah. to try to get it done next year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It must bring back some incredible memories, all of that. Yeah, it's digging into the past. It's um, it's interesting, you know, trying to find all of those little stories that you've forgotten about, and all of a sudden you're doing your research. Like, Damn, I did I say that? Wow, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's dig in a little deep. Yeah. That's the whole thing. People want to hear, hear all the mistakes you made and all the good stuff you did. Is you know, you've got you've got to show both sides. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, uh, we're uh, like I said, we're approaching zero hour. I would like to thank um, the family at Gibson, just a great folks. Uh, Cody Allen, particularly, have been uh, she's been a, a, a an ally of mine for a long time, and uh, she's uh, nurtured the relationship with with Eddie. 
and um, and the rest of the Gibson family. Thank you all, and uh, thank you, Eddie. Thank you so much. Thank you My for pleasure. thank you for for your history and for many years just really sharing with all of us. A lot of great questions here, and I'm I'm sure everyone understands we couldn't get to all of them, uh, but this is a, a testament to the work you've done with great people and the fact that you've been so giving. You know, I, I, I always love you for that. And I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, yeah. Brian. Thank you, okay. everybody. Gibson. We love you. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.